First Peter chapter 1 verse 13 and she's going to show that up on the screen but it says that we're given grace it says let me just read it says therefore gird up the loins of your mind be ready uh, in some versions it means be ready for action you got to first be ready in your mind if you're going to be ready physically but be sober and rest your hope fully say fully fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're living in the days of the revelation of Jesus. Above all, all things are going to be summed up in Jesus Christ, right? And so we as the church, you know, we're not following one stream. We're following Christ, the head. And we're going to make him known and we're going to proclaim his word above all. He's the revelation. And there's going to be a grace available to those who seek him in this hour, in this day, to battle, to stand firm against all the powers of antichrist and darkness. Did you hear that? You guys on board? You got to get that from Jesus. You have to have that anointing, that grace. And uh, so anyway, Lord, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the time of intercession. Thank you for the people that are a part of this church body that carry mantles, anointings. They carry fire for nations, for Israel, for, Lord, Africa, for nations of all around the world. Lord, we thank you that we're the church of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, there is going to be a grace given to each of us. And we're going to be ready for action in this hour at the revelation, the revealing of Jesus. And we're going to have that grace, and we're going to walk in great authority, confidence, courage. We will not be cowards. We will not shrink back. We're going to see your glory, just as you said. The whole earth is full of the glory of the Lord. Now, Lord, I pray today, God, you put this in my heart. Some of this I've waited a bunch of years to release. And so I pray, Lord, just let your word go forth. Help us. Lord, come, Holy Spirit. We want to see your glory. Open our eyes, God. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you for Jonathan Kahn. Thank you for Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you for all the men and women out there. Many, we don't even know their names, but they're holding down their fort. They're doing what you've called them to do in their region, in their sphere of influence. And they're not backing up. And they're full of the grace and power of God. And Lord, may we all be there. Especially in this hour in which you've summoned us to in Jesus' name. Amen. I woke up, was it yesterday morning? Yes. Do you ever get your days mixed up? (laughs) Getting weeks mixed up. What's bad is if you get months mixed up. But we've done that before. And, uh, but anyway, I woke up with a scripture on, on my mind, and it's out of Job chapter 19, verse 25. And before I read that, I want to remind us of something, and you know as well, that everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. So you can't get your feelings hurt. You can't, if you get offended at something being shaken, That means there's something inside of you that needs to be shaken. If something riles up, every, all of our belief systems, our doctrinal understanding, our views of the end of the age. I remember years ago when I wrote that little book out there, The Times to Come Have Come, I remember the Lord pressed upon me, he said, one of the greatest deceptions will be regarding the end of the age is that people will look more to the coming of the Lord and how they see it fit together rather than the Lord that is coming. And it'll lead them into error and deception. And if possible, even the elect will be deceived. So everything is going to be shaken. Our nation's security is being shaken. Our trust in our nation to defend us, all that we built our lives on, the education system that we put we poured into, we were a part of, 
where we used to pray, we used to open up the day in prayer, open up reading the scriptures, everything has been shaken. Now, it's like a salt shaker. When you shake salt, what, you know, it's something's going to come out, right? And uh, so you could expect things to start coming out. And um, we're not going to be offended. If you're offended, it's because I'm telling you there's some idol there. We want everything tested in this hour. Everything, my faith, my love for him, my love for my neighbor, the things I say I believe in. We don't, you remember Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? And so we need our faith tested. We need to know that we're standing upon solid foundation. Does that all make sense? And we know that, that God's called us to this time. Now, now, this scripture, I think it's up there, Job 19, 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Have any of you been through the suffering, the shame, the, the embarrassment, the, the loss? Really, it was loss of everything. Have any of you been lost as much as Job lost? Do we have anybody in here that could compare with Job? I don't see any hands. Job lost it all, and he learned that he had to trust in his Redeemer. And uh, he trusted in the one. He said, God, though you slay me, yet will I place my trust in you. And uh, he didn't think the devil was his greatest, well, he was his adversary, but He knew whom his Redeemer was. He knew who was ultimately over all things. And uh, so we need to have that same kind of confession. I just thought we should just look at that verse before I get into the Word. Do you know that your Redeemer lives? Are you absolutely certain that regardless of what's shaken in this hour, what's removed from you, what you may lose in this life, that he will be the one that will be standing when it's all said and done? You know, all the king's horses, all the king's men, they're not going to put Humpty Dumpty together again. We want Humpty Dumpty smushed, scrapped. We want it all shattered. We want Jesus lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. And then he said, after my skin is destroyed, whatever that meant, you look at Job's testimony, I don't want to live through what he lived through. But going through all of that, he was still confident. He was 100% convinced that in my flesh, I will see my God. I'm going to see him, and we shall behold him. Now, you know, the shaking is not going to be that comfortable to your flesh. Did you not know we're supposed to be sharing in the sufferings of Christ? So that's not going to be that comfortable. Your mind is going to be a little bit... You know, you're going to be tempted to think all kinds of things. That's why you need everything shaken out so you can be standing firm. There's only one thing that won't be shaken in this hour, the kingdom of our God. That's it. One king, one kingdom, and all of those that know the king will be a part of that kingdom. That's it. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither, you know, Ukrainian or Iranian or Brazilian. We're in Christ Jesus. That's it. One people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood chosen for this hour. And so we have to stand on the solid foundation. That's part of my role, to help one another stand. I need help. And guess what? We have the helper. Jan, you have the helper. He's not going to desert you in this hour. You think he's called you to this day to desert you and leave you on your own? He's given us divinely powerful weapons. And he's going to prove that the greater one is not in the world. The spirit of Antichrist, the greater one lives in you and me. And it's Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Now, go with me, if you would, to Nehemiah chapter 8 and... um, This is actually uh, part two of a message that we began on Friday night, and uh, we attempted to begin what's called a solemn assembly. I don't know that we did everything right. I'm sure we didn't, but we gathered, 
and we let her rip the first time. I say the first time because I have a feeling there will be other times. In fact, you know, I was thinking about that scripture, Job. I wonder if that's a picture of the last day church. Jesus is coming to shake everything that can be shaken out of his people so that he's coming for a bride without spot and blemish. So everything is falling away, everything, so that he's coming for a pure and spotless bride. And that bride is not shaken by what they're losing. They're confident in who they will see and they know who lives. They're confident. I know my Redeemer lives. And when my skin is destroyed, whatever that means, doesn't sound that good to me, but I know I'm confident I shall see him standing on the earth. Anyway, what a a glorious day that will be. My dad used to sing that song, on a day, what a glorious day. I don't remember, but I remember him singing it, and my Aunt Beulah and my my uncles, and they sang it with power and authority. Oh, what a day that'll be. And we can't forget there's a day coming. The Lord Jesus is ultimately going to reign. You know, peace ultimately will come from the Prince of Peace. Yes. And so we, that's our confidence. Okay, so Friday night, go to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. I've got to finish today. I'd encourage you to go back. You ought to listen to Friday night. I don't know if I can repeat the same fire. I don't know. How am I going to do this, Lord? I'm just trusting because I've been holding on to this message a long time. So in verse 17, so the whole assembly of those who'd returned from the captivity made booths. They sat under the booths and, you know, this feast that many of us, even this day, it just happened. And uh, until the day the children of Israel had done so, and there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day into the last, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a sacred or solemn assembly, according to the prescribed manner. And that's what I had asked the Lord when I read that. I said, God, did we do it? Did we do Friday night according to the prescribed manner that you would have desired? And I thought, well, my first thought was, you preach too long, talking to myself, because I wasn't planning on doing that. And then I started reading the beginning. I thought, wait a minute, I didn't preach too long. If you back up in chapter 8, you know what happened on that day. It said in verse 3, then he read it. He was reading the law of God, and there's an open square from morning until midday. So they read the word. In a big chunk of the day, and uh, so the people stood. They didn't leave. They stood, actually, during the preaching, the reading of the word. In verse 6, and Ezra blessed the Lord, and all the people answered and said, Amen, Amen. And while lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads, they worshiped, and they, they, their faces were toward the ground. There was, they listened to the word of God first. America needs not to hear the word of what someone's opinion is, especially in this hour. We need to hear the word of the living God. When you get more out of what somebody says rather than what God has spoken, you can, say, you can be certain something is awry in your walk with Jesus. Because you're, you're, you're gaining from others. You should be hearing. All my people will hear him from the gra- least to the greatest. We all have Jesus living inside of us. The word has been written in our heart. And so we should be able to know the truth. We should discern between right and wrong and that which is of the flesh and that which is of the spirit. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. So we need to hear the word. But then they repented. They were broken. They were gathered. And they were attentive. They, you know, I was thinking Friday night, you know, how... Um, you know, there was a little bit of repentance. A solemn assembly was not supposed to be just intercession for whoever. That was not the purpose. They were coming together to repent, to turn to the Lord, to cry out to Him. I think a little of that happened. God has a way of causing a lot of that to happen. 
But I thought about Dr. Mark, and he shared about repenting beginning with us, and I thought, you know, that may have been the best part of the whole night. And, uh, but, you know, it's okay. The Lord understands, and I think we're going to get better. But we have to do things His way. We need a foundation of the Word. You should be in the Word of God every single day, every day. And if you miss a day, you don't condemn yourself. Just shake it off. Repent. Lord, I'm so sorry. I obviously had more things to do or better things to do than spend time with you. Repent. Say, God, I'm sorry. What do you think he's going to do? Forgive us. Confess our sin. Every day, daily, go to him. Every day. And then just read, stand, spend time with him. So now let's just review a few things. We t- I won't read there, but in Jeremiah chapter 5, remember the big problem was their refusal to hear the word of God. That is one of the big problems in America today. We put more stock in what someone said than in thus saith the Lord. And you can hear it in their conversation. We must hear the counsel of heaven. Psalm 33:10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Say nothing. He brings or makes the plans of the people of no effect. We should be praying that. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generations. It also, the scripture says, a lamp is despised by those who are at ease. A lamp, the word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. For those who do not want to be bothered or reminded of their sin, and who are at ease, then they are offended when the word of God is preached. They're really offended. But the rest of that verse says, a lamp is despised by those who are at ease, but it is made ready for those whose feet slip. And so in this day, when everything's being shaken, we need the word of God, the, the word. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is ready to aid, to help his church. We need to be reminded often, all flesh is as grass. The grass withers, the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, the problem was in Jeremiah, and the problem in our day is they did not understand the judgments of God. They had no understanding because they, they must have been in the charismatic world of our day. That God's not like that anymore. He's changed. No, whom he loves, he disciplines. That's New Testament. But anyway, in Jeremiah, whatever was written for beforehand, we know was written for our example on whom the ends of the ages have come. Could it be possible we are among those who are at the end of the ages? Is it possible? Okay, so it's written for you. We look at the examples But we learn, it's the instruction of Scripture. And uh, anyway, they didn't understand the judgments of God. Job understood understood the judgments. He said in chapter 12, verse 23, that it's God who makes nations great, and it's God that destroys them. Did you hear that? Job understood it. If you'd gone through what Job went through, you would gain that, that sense of the sovereignty of God as well. That only God can make a nation great, and God himself will destroy that nation. He will turn into hell every nation that forgets him. It's what the Bible says. The only hope is the Savior, is Jesus Christ. And that's what we proclaim. Now, now in Jeremiah, the watchmen, they were in their midst. They were shouting. They were declaring with the people they, had, they didn't want to hear. They had their own doctrines of which they clung to. And then the Lord said, okay, I'm going to bring a nation against you from afar. It was the Assyrians, the, one of the most ruthless group of people in, in all of history. You think ISIS is bad, Hamas? These guys were ruthless. I even I started to go there. I, I was thinking about where it said the Lord, because of the rebellion of his people, he whistled to the nations. He went, and the nations came, and there was an invasion so that the people would fear God and turn back to him. 
Because God loves his people. If he loves his people, he will not let them continue down the road of destruction. He'll intervene and show himself strong and come quickly. And I believe the book of Joel gives us a key for this hour. And I, even the book of Joel has been grossly misunderstood by prophets, by preachers, by the leading theologians of our day. Have you noticed I'm not that confident in theologians? I've, I'm glad I got a doctor's degree so I can say this. A doctor's degree means nothing if you disagree with what God has to say. Absolutely nothing. It's a DR behind your name. I actually, some of you know, I, I had that on hold for like 20 years. I did all the work until the final thesis, and I put it on hold. And then I felt like the Lord said, no, go ahead and get the stupid thing. Stupid, get it. So I did. I worked hard. And uh, anyway, I don't, it, it's not where my confidence is. So anyway, in Joel, let me give you a review. Then we're going to read the last part like I said we would. And I'm asking God to help it all make sense. Because if something happens when a people call on their God. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm hanging out for. That's what I'm in this thing for the long haul to see. The glory of the Lord. Not another nation just fall by the wayside. God's called us into the kingdom not to see defeat, but see all things come under his realm, under his authority, to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. To see the glory of the Lord fill the land and always triumph in Christ Jesus. Anybody else with me? I got saved with that song, though none go with me, yet I will follow. And that's still been my testimony. His cross before me, everyone may go the other way. They may fall into all of these false doctrines. I'm going to follow the Christ who suffered on the cross for me and gave me redemption. And in that day, I will see him, my redeemer, shall live. Above every other false god, every other idol, Jesus will live forever. And every tongue will bow, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. I just want to do it on this side of glory. So that he can welcome me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in little, and now I'm going to make you ruler over much. I don't want to be a ruler. I just want to be in on the game. I want to be one of his sons. And I know that's your testimony. Now, in Joel, a disaster struck suddenly out of no warning. Joel is the chosen messenger to deliver the word of the Lord. And we said Friday night that God always reserves men and women that were kept for his word to be delivered at a right time. There's sometimes you can deliver a word prematurely. It's the word of the Lord, but it's not ready. It's like you need to, it needs to kind of, you know, regurgitate or something. I don't know. It just needs to be in the works. You need to make sure you're walking in it, I guess, before you can deliver the message. And so God has men, he has women, he's got people in this room and watching. He's about to release on the nations with thus saith the Lord. And demons are going to scream because of the word of our God. I'm telling you, the word of our God is greater than the words that are going to soon be proven as nothing but words. Now, we, in Joel, there was a swarm of locusts that devoured everything in the land. You can read it. They were crawling, consuming, swarming. Man, these locusts were having their day. Now, where do you think the locusts came from? Most people in the charismatic church in America would say the devil. I'm going to show you different. They came from God Almighty because of the sin of the people, the rebellion of the people. He wanted to get their attention before they were completely destroyed for all of eternity. You know, we have an awesome backdrop of which to preach the gospel in this hour. We can tell people without any shadow of a doubt, the wages of your sin is death. There's no other option. Jesus said, either you're for me or you're against me. You look for a, a people or a nation that is for him. Him. 
or they are against him. One or the other. The whole world's going to line up under the spirit of Antichrist or they're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said. You're for me or you are against me. And you're pretending to be for me will soon be exposed because he's coming for a bride without spot and blemish that's made ready. They're not in bed with the world. They're waiting for their bridegroom. And anyway, so we know the wages of sin is death. We can trumpet that. But thank God it doesn't stop there, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So we can proclaim the gospel. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Do you know what I'm saying? So you don't have to go very far to find where sin is, is rampant. So just go there and proclaim the truth. There's a gift. You have a gift. You have one that loves you. It is true. God so loved the world. That's going to be our message until he comes. Now back to Joel. Remember we said Friday night, as horrible as the locusts were, he wanted to remind them, you hadn't seen anything yet. Because the day of the Lord is coming. And it's a day of darkness and gloominess. And it's a day where this, all of the horde of darkness will be loosed, the judgments of God upon sin and rebellion. But he reminded them, for those who turn back, of which there will be a remnant, God is going to rise up, and he's going to then, can I just say it like I feel, kick butt of all the darkness. I thought about that scripture in Thessalonians. When he comes, you know, he's going to, do it all. He's going to do away, and God's going to reign and rule. So anyway, Joel, let's just review again really quickly. The word of the Lord came. He gathered the elders. You know, make sure you tell your children, awake, over in chapter 1, verse 5, awake, wake up, wake up. Has the Lord been saying, wake up today? Wake up, America, wake up, wake up, your borders. You think they're coming. Can I tell you they're already in the borders? They've been loosed in the land. They're just waiting for the whistle to blow. That's it. Or a people that will rise up and call on their God. Not intercede, but call on God for help because our helper comes from him. And then he says in verse 6, a nation has come against you, against my land. Say my land. Strong and without number. And his teeth are the teeth of a lion. And he has the fangs of a fierce lion and has laid waste my vine. He's ruined my fig tree. He stripped it bare and thrown it away. Oh, boy, we could read more of that. So he's just saying, be ashamed. Turn to the Lord. Gird yourself up. Verse 13, ministers, come, lay before me, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. Cry out to the Lord. Alas, the day of the Lord will come. It's on hand. That's what's coming. And so cry out to him. Verse 19, O Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pastures. And anyway, chapter 2, verse 1, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth do what? Tremble. America has lost the trembling at the word of God. Before it's all said and done, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm telling you this nation will again tremble at thus saith the Lord because they'll have a reason to tremble and all the nations tremble. Then he goes on about the gloominess, the darkness of the day of the Lord. I'm glad he doesn't stop there. And uh, then he says how I'm going to send a people great and strong, the like. You've never seen them in the history of humanity. And they're going to come. Before them is like the Garden of Eden, but after when they come through, it's all destroyed. Flame burned up. And then he talks about his great army, the verse 11. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and strong is the one who executes his word, the word of judgment. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible who can endure it. And then in verse 12 of chapter 2, again, he's saying, rend your heart, not your garments. 
turn to me. God, who knows, he might relent and turn back and leave a blessing. Blow the trumpet, consecrate a fast, sanctify the congregation. Let the bridegroom go out of his chamber. Let the priest minister and all of that. Cry out to God. Look look in verse uh, 18, or actually verse 17 of chapter 2. That the nations, why should the nations rule over you? That's what he's saying. Why should they, the world, say among the people, where is your God? Where is their God? Why should the people, why should the nations, the heathen, look to America and say, where is your God, America? You, you preached the gospel to the ends of the earth. You said you had the testimony of Jesus. I've been reading your papers. I've been looking on your websites. I've been hearing your pulpits. No one is standing for truth, or at least only few. Where is your God now, America, as you pervert your children? As you tell them there's no male nor female. As you send them to institutions to indoctrinate them in the spirit of Antichrist. Where is your God that you say you believe in? Why should the nation say that? Now look in verse 18, and here's how we finish, okay? So there are a bunch of things. A solemn assembly is supposed to be repentance, the fear of the Lord, because you recognize the sovereignty of God, that the problem is not hell in this case. It's the problem is our repentance, our heart. And God is trying to get our attention. Now, just look at the rest of that. So, anyway, there's so much more. Now, you know, just, just to make sure, you, I, I guess I need to read one more thing. Job said, for the hand of the Lord has struck me. Again, that just showed us where his faith was. Not in the devil. His faith was in God. I'm not saying we don't do battle with principalities and powers. We know we do that. But first, you've got to make sure who's ruling on the throne of your heart. And then Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Look in Lamentations real quick. And then we'll finish up with Job. Lamentations. I read a scripture Friday night out of Jeremiah. No, Isaiah. It was Isaiah 45. And how God basically, out of the mouth of God, comes both woe and well-being. You don't hear that preached. You don't hear that because we've lost the fear of God. That's why we have no fear of God in the land today. You know, why fear God? God's not in charge. You just fear the devil. He must be the cause. There's a greater one than he. Now, look at Lamentations chapter 3. This is more emphasized. And verse... 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth or bondage or adversity or affliction if he must. Is it better? Remember David said, it was good that I was afflicted. For now, I I know you. I trust you. I, I know your word. I turn to your word. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it on him. What? The yoke. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. That's the Bible. Boy, God did a great job. The Holy Spirit did a great job preserving this for us. So whatever the condition you're going through, there may yet still be hope. Well, let's read. What's he talking about? Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. And be full of reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever, though he causes grief. Who causes grief? The devil. You have to change your Bible. I, you know, I got a, an eraser around here. If anybody wants to borrow it and change the Word of God, you can. Just erase that word there. For the Lord will not cast us off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly. You know what that means? That means it's not in God's heart to destroy anyone. That's not his heart. His heart, he knows the wages of sin is death. He knows a nation that has forsaken him will be turned into hell. All hell will be loosed on that land. And so he's crying out. His heart 
is for the salvation of the people. He doesn't grieve, do all this willingly. Who is he who speaks and it shall come to pass? Verse 37. When the Lord has not commanded it, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? So why should a man, a living man, complain a man for the punishment of his sins? Did anybody see that? Why should you complain? Why should you complain, America, for the punishment of your sin? Because you've rejected a holy God. Should be no complaint. There should be repentance, fasting, rending your heart, turning back. So that's what he goes on. He says in verse 40, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Is that not the message America needs to hear? America, your enemies are within your gates. You have one Savior, and you must turn to him because he's offered himself to you. For God so loved America, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, whoever will not perish. And so it's about turning back. Now let's go back to uh, Joel in verse 18. I, I saw a bunch of things. I'm just going to point them out quickly. And um, there'll be other solemn assemblies. I told my pastor buddies, I mean, I, wouldn't, I just sent them a little information. I didn't want to press them to come because I didn't know if I would do it right. And anyway, God will help us. And in verse 18, then the Lord, then. Now, now what happened? Okay, put it this way. What would happen if somehow... America got wind of this message, and all of a sudden, there's solemn assemblies from the West Coast to the East Coast, from the Gulf of Mexico to the border of Canada. What if a people started turning from sin and turning to the Lord, crying out for mercy and help and grace from above? What if they started repenting, God, forgive us for the sin that was just due? Because you are just in all of your ways. You are merciful and kind. God, have mercy on our sin. Forgive us. What would happen? What do you think? Do you think our military is going to save us? They've already been taken, folks. There's some good guys in the military. But those who oversee them, those who control them. So we better not put our faith in chariots or horses our faith must be in the name of the Lord our God, in the angelic host that Richard spoke of, who come to battle on behalf of a people whose heart is pure before him. And they're holy and they're crying out for the mercies of heaven. And that's, okay, so here's what would happen. Okay, verse 18, then the Lord would be zealous. He'd be, man, the zeal of the Lord would do this thing. The zeal of the Lord for his land, he would pity his people. Verse 19, the Lord will answer and say to his people, he'll answer our cry, he'll answer our intercession of which we've been crying out and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil. And you remember we read Friday night, they, had, they were accustomed to the old and so therefore they, the, the new was, was being withheld because of their sin. And they thought the old was the new, and it wasn't. There was something far greater. And then he said, I not only sin, but verse 20, but I will remove far from you the northern army. Do you think we're going to be able to remove the armies from this midst alone or from Fort Polk or every fort? God said, listen, oh, man, Friday night was amazing when Dr. Kyle got up here. He had this incredible dream about God releasing these little pieces of paper that had messages that were going to get to all the people, all the body of Christ, so you could be on the same page and so you could pray. And then he talked about how, how this is not a hard thing for our God. Do you know how hard it would be for God to move his finger and drive the enemies out of this land? 
Nothing is too hard for our God. I don't care what degree they have over our education system, over every institution in the land. I don't care whether they own Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and Princeton and UNC. My God can move and crush the powers. When God arises, his enemy will be scattered. He said, I will remove the foreign army from you. Your part is to call out to me. Don't trust in horses and chariots. In the arm of the flesh will fail you. But the spirit, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now look at this. This is amazing. So I'll remove the far from you, this northern army, the army that he sent. And some of you know what we talked about Friday Much of the church preach that this Joel's army are believers, getting in shape, getting in line. They're not going to break ranks. Totally out of the context of God's word. It was an absolute pretext. Now, does God have an army? Absolutely he does. Not Joel's army. Joel's army is the judgment. All right, so let's go on. Now, this is what's cool. I'll drive away. Man, I'll get rid of this. And he'll turn his face toward the sea and back toward him. He's going to run him out. His stench will come up. And his foul odor will rise because he's done monstrous things. Is the enemy doing monstrous things in the earth today? In Israel, when I'm hearing the stories of what's happened, monstrous. We know where Hamas has come from, not Gaza. They came from the pit of hell. And then when we heard, we know who financed them. Woe to America, for your hands are filled with innocent blood. And God is the one we're going to have to stand and answer to. We should be repenting, crying out to our God. Our hearts are broken. And our hearts are broken by the innocent being bombed in Gaza. Children, babies, men and women. The devil wants everybody dead. He wants the church in Iran dead. He wants us dead. We're just the, we're like in the final, I mean, we're out there crying out to God now. And I guarantee you the Iranian church is crying out to God for us. I guarantee you they're on their knees because they know the importance of this nation. And they're saying, oh God, awaken our brothers, sisters in America. Send a great spiritual awakening, God, before it's too late. They're crying out to heaven. And it would be just like the enemy to destroy them in a flash and to wipe out their prayers and their heart cry. The enemy comes to destroy and kill everybody. He's no respecter of persons. All right, let's go on. Now, this is what's really good. They're monstrous, but he says, Fear not, O land, be glad, verse 21, and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous. God can change the monstrous to the marvelous in a heartbeat. Did you see that? He can take the monstrous and put it down and raise up the marvelous wonder of God in the midst of his people. That sounds like to me what I'm voting for and I'm believing for. Verse 23, be glad you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. He's given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down. He wants to answer the prayers of revival and refreshing and renewal, the former, the latter. He wants to send it. Verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army, which I send among you. I want to restore. What kind of God is that? It's the God of heaven. It's the God who reigns, who's sovereign above all. That's who that is. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who's done wondrously things with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then you will know that I am the Lord in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. And my people shall never be put to shame. But there's a process. Then look in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Can we remove that word? Anybody? Afterward. Now, I know there have been outpourings of the Spirit. 
We're praying for one here. I think there's been one in our midst. The outpouring of the Spirit has done an amazing thing. It's cleaned out some, brought others in. It's just, there's glory, there's joy, there's happiness in the house of God. It doesn't matter who shows up anymore. We just, God, you're in our midst. So I know that's happening. I'm not losing heart. But I know this. It shall come to pass afterward. I know we hadn't seen anything yet, especially what God wants to do beyond. And I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Thank you, Lord. And your young men shall see visions. And also my men, my women, I'm going to pour out my spirit in those days. Some of the most. You know Annie, the interpreter in Africa. She's one of these women fiery woman of God in Uganda. It's not because of what you and I have done. It's because of people like Annie over there that cried out to God. Then I'm, now, this is when it gets interesting. And then, as a part of the outpouring, I'm going to show wonders in the heaven, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before, right before the coming of the great and the awesome, terrible day of the Lord. So there's going to be things going on in the heavens. So do we believe in revival? I've heard people say, well, you guys, there's some people say, you believe in revival. That ain't going to happen. Judgment's coming. Then others say, but hey, you believe in judgment. Well, I believe in both. If I'm just reading, at the same time, there's a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God's going to demonstrate his power over the rulers and the heavens in the darkness And there's going to be some earth-shaking events that will take place. But then in verse 32, and it shall come to pass. Here's the harvest that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I think that's happening and will happen. So we got to get in on it now and be ready for it through all time. Because it's his will that none should perish. We just believe that. For in Mount Zion, I like this part too. In Mount Zion shall, and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said among the remnant, and we know there's a remnant. We pray all of Israel shall be saved. Yet absolutely in the New Testament, there's a remnant. So we just pray. It's like knowing it's his will for all to be saved. Does that mean everybody will be saved? No. But pray as if, my wife prays as if everybody that's going to die on a certain day will get saved before they die. That's how she prays. She's been praying that for years. She says, God, for everyone that's appointed to die today, I ask you to break in. Reveal Jesus to them. I claim their souls for Christ. It's an amazing ministry. We should believe God. And then it will come to pass, I'll pour out my spirit. And the, Now, we better get on or we won't get through here, but... For behold, in those days and at that time, bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will gather all nations. And then it's that final battle of Jehoshaphat, the battle of Armageddon. And I don't understand everything. You know, God, we all see through a glass dimly, right? Nobody has the whole picture. Jonathan Kahn has an amazing understanding, revelation. And, but then so do others. And so we all together, the Lord is purpose that we not all see everything clearly, but that we see him. And if we see him, the head, all of the parts sharing what they see of the head are going to see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our king. Well, in those days, I'm going to gather all the nations. And anyway, they've cast lots for my people and given a boy as a payment and there's a... Anyway, I, we can't get into all of it, but basically in verse 4 and verse 5, retaliation comes. Verse 5, God says, because you've taken my silver and my gold. I wish I could tell that to the people that are trying to do that now. Because you've taken my silver and my gold, and you've carried into your temples my prized possessions, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you've sold to the Greeks that you may remove them from their borders. Behold, I will raise them out of the place. Anyway, God's going to retaliate. And then, now here's, our, here's, our, here's the word for us. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. 
So it's the same time there are natural things happening. You and I are called to the greater battle, which is a battle of the spirit. We know this thing's all spiritual battle, right? In the heavens, but it's being played out on the earth. And we're being prepared. We're being given the grace so that our minds will be ready at the revelation of Jesus Christ for this last day ultimate battle with the forces of Antichrist. Do you know you've been chosen for this? And the people who know their God shall be strong, and they shall carry out great exploits. The wicked will do wickedly, but the righteous will do righteously. And I know the Antichrist will have his time and his seat. That's what all this battle over there is about. He's going to seat himself for just a short time. And then the Lord will come and consume him with the brightness of his coming. And he that thought he was ruling will rule no more. But he that is the ruler will rule forevermore. I hope you know these things. And then here's how you finish it up. Okay, Lord, we're in battles. Multitudes are in the valley of decision. Nations are in the valley of decision. America's in the valley of decision. And this is, but the Lord, look at the verse, end of verse 16. But the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Did you see that? The Lord, for his people and for Israel, the Lord will be a shelter. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. And no aliens shall ever pass through her again. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord. Do you know? Now, this is amazing. In the walls, all written around this building, when the people would come to volunteer to build this place long before you and I got here, we weren't even thought of. Well, I was, but I was somewhere else, and we were. But we were somewhere else. But all on the walls, behind the paint, downstairs, are these scriptures about from the house of God, the throne, will flow the word of the Lord to all the nations. These people that built this place believed it was going to happen here. They must have didn't know who was going to occupy. Well, I'm glad they didn't know. God knew, and God chose you to live on the earth at this time in history. And the love that he's given you, the passion, the anointing, you don't hold back for anything. You cry out to God for the salvation of those souls that will be held in the balance because of your intercession and your activation of reigning and ruling in this life. Boy, there's so much more. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just acquit them of their guilt, their bloodshed. But anyway, this is, how you, this is how you end all this up. You end it up right there where he says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Because our nation, nations are in the valley of decision right now. But what about the individuals? Where you live, you may not can make any impact on your government leaders. You pray for them. You trust God. But they've not chosen who you will serve. They're trying. But you said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm a nation. I'm a people in this nation that will declare that Jesus is my Lord. So you make that decision. And right now, you make that decision all over the earth. I believe right now, God's calling people all across America. It's, it, is it the last call? I don't know. I've heard people say that. I, I don't know. But we should, be, we should preach as if it's the last call that anyone will ever hear. Because today is the day of salvation. Individually, nationally, global. God is a big God. Listen, nothing is impossible with our God. Is this thing too hard for him? Nothing. And so, Father, I thank you. Thank you for the grace to deliver the word. And thank you, God, that you've given us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, I pray for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I ask you, God, to make your word like fire, 
that breaks up the hardness of the hearts. Lord, I ask you to send the convicting power of heaven. And I ask you to cause multitudes to turn back to you and be saved is my prayer.